reading from the book of Genesis. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support them if they stayed together. Their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. There were quarrels between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and those of Lot's. At this time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were occupying the land. So Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land at your disposal? Please separate from me. If you prefer the left, I will go to the right. If you prefer the right, I will go to the left. Lot looked about and saw how well watered the whole Jordan plain was as far as Zor, like the Lord's own garden or like Egypt. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot therefore chose for himself the whole Jordan plain and set out eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram stayed in the land of Canaan while Lot setting among the cities of the plain, pitching his tents near Sodom. Now the inhabitants of Sodom were very wicked in the sins they committed against the Lord. After Lot had left, the Lord said to Abram, Look about you and from where you are. Gaze to the north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth. If anyone could count the dust of the earth, your descendants too might be counted. Set forth and walk about in the land, through its length and its breadth. For to you I will give it. Abram moved his tents and went on to settle, near the terebinth of Mamre, which is at Hebron. There he built an altar to the Lord. Verbum Domini. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. He who walks blamelessly and does justice, who thinks the truth in his heart and slanders not with his tongue. who harms not his fellow man, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, by whom the reprobate is despised, while he honors those who fear the Lord. Who lends not his money at usury, and accepts no bride against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be disturbed.
Jesus said to his disciples, do not give what is holy to dogs or throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and tear you to pieces. Do to others whatever you would have them do to you. This is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and those who enter through it are many. How narrow the gate and constricted the road that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in this time after Pentecost, the church constantly presents for our meditation various virtues and various spiritual experiences that should characterize those who receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. And today is no exception. In the first reading, we have Abram and Lot basically dividing their possessions according or the land on which they graze their livestock, in other words, their property. And Abram, being the older of the two, being the uncle, and by the way, I would point out here for those who have difficulty with the brothers and sisters of Jesus, that scripture often uses the term brother not to refer to the brother and sister, but to the close relatives, and this is no exception in this particular case. It demonstrates it was common practice among the Jews. These people are uncle and nephew, even though they're called brothers. Anyway, they're dividing up the land, and Abram leaves the decision what lands they will receive to Lot, even though he is the younger. Let there be no strife between you and me, or between your kinsmen and herdsmen and mine, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land at your disposal? And then he accepts the division which Lot has made. Now, this is sort of very different from us. As you know, they say the quickest way to break up your family is to have a fight over the inheritance. Once the money gets involved, for some reason it causes terrible family strife, even among people who before have considered themselves quite affectionate and had a good relationship. In this, Abraham is considered to be adopting a famous virtue, which was described by Aristotle as magnanimity, which means greatness of soul. In Aristotle's ethics, he describes magnanimity in this way, and you have to remember we're talking about a pagan here, but what he's trying to say is a person who's magnanimous, who's great of soul, doesn't take a, a note of trivialities. What they're concerned about is the big picture, not the small picture. He that claims less than he deserves is small-souled. For the great soul man is justified in despising other people. Now, he doesn't mean not hating them or anything, but in, in the sense that he doesn't consider their opinion that important because he uh, you know, has soul possession himself. He must be open in both love and in hate since concealment shows timidity and care more for the truth than for what people think and speak and act openly since he despises what other people say of him, he is outspoken and frank, except when speaking with ironic self-depreciation as he does to ordinary people. He does not bear a grudge for it is not a mark of greatness of soul to recall things against people especially the wrongs they have done you, but rather to overlook them. Now, this is a pagan description, but Christianity adds to this the idea that when we receive the Holy Spirit, that we have to now adopt God's way of looking at things, which makes it even more important for us not to consider what other people think of us. An interesting application of this, which touches the gospel passage due to others what you, you know, what you would have them do unto you, is found in the recommendations made by St. Teresa of Avila to her nuns in the way of perfection. In this, she describes, first of all, the most important virtue for progress in the spiritual life is humility. 
By humility, she doesn't mean beautiful women tell themselves they're ugly and strong men tell themselves they're weak because that's not true. Truth is very important for her. In fact, she has a famous statement, I'd rather a soul lack prayer than lack truth. And people used to say about her, her confessor said about her, this is a woman who doesn't know deceit. She can't be deceitful. Truth is very important. So for her, humility is found on truth in relationships. The first and most obvious relationship being our relationship with God. In another place, Christ says to her daughter, learn what I can do and what you can do. And this is the truth and this is humility. Now, she has a very practical way of expressing this and it, ex it relates to the whole idea that magnanimity demands that we don't care what other people think of us. Thomas Aquinas, when he treats of humility, says that we have to suffer humiliations, but not in all cases. In fact, he says it's characteristic of stupidity, not intelligence and discretion, to suffer humiliations when they're not demanded by charity. St. Teresa applies this with her nuns by saying there are basically three characteristics in community life. Now, of course, she is speaking to religious, but I would say she could speak to all of us in this way, which demonstrate this virtue. And she calls this the great virtues. You know, she didn't have much interest in physical exaggerated penances, even though people did a lot of them in her time. Of course, I always say today, uh, I don't have to do fastings and vigils because I consider meetings to be the modern fastings and vigils. One is much more frustrated over the complete inability of meetings to resolve anything than one would be over physical pain. Anyway, the first is you have to renounce being a drama queen or a drama king to think that the whole world revolves around you and your reactions and to put your difficulties, make them more of them than they really are, to place them in their proper place. We all have difficulties, we all have imperfections. But we need to realize that our imperfections partially, at least, demonstrate to us where we need God to help us with his grace. The second is to renounce always having to be right. Now, this is an extremely important virtue, I think, in every society. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, we don't have to agree with other people, but to experience a kind of union True humility in their regard, we have to take their opinion seriously as their opinion. They have their point of view. You may think it's nuts, but still they have a right to their point of view. The third thing, however, is the most difficult for us because St. Teresa had a great devotion. She connected humility very much with the life of our Lord to what she called the silence of our Lord. And that is to renounce defending yourself when you're unjustly accused. She says this in the way of perfection. For I disliked hearing things that were true said about me, whereas these other things, however serious they were, I didn't mind at all. In small matters, I follow my own inclination and I still do so without paying any affection to what is most perfect. So I should like you to begin to realize this at an early stage. And I want each of you to ponder how much there is to be gained in every way by this virtue, and how so far as I can see, there's nothing to be lost by it. The chief thing we gain is being able in some degree to follow the Lord, because the Lord, remember, except when, and this is important, this is why intelligence is necessary, either offense or scandal is involved where a person has to defend themselves, he, our Lord didn't really answer people back, except in one case. You remember when he was slapped by the high priest, servant, he didn't turn and say, oh, even though I said turn the other cheek, hit me harder on the other side. He said, if I've done something wrong, prove it. If not, why do you hit me? In other words, he told the truth. She maintains that this virtue is a proof of the presence of the spiritual life and of great gain because, you know, when you deprive yourself of physical food and things, it causes your body great suffering. But here the suffering is only interior and it's only really known to you and God. First of all, if you defend yourself against others, 
any of us who live in community life know this, and community life is our great leveler, you know, it's where your virtue is actually proven, you're not going to usually convince people that they're wrong. So it's kind of useless to defend yourself anyway. Usually it confirms them in the fact that what they thought about you was true. Secondly, whose estimation and judgment are we really concerned about? Human beings are often mistaken in their judgments about other people. It's something we need to constantly tell ourselves. We could be wrong especially if we're judging people's interior motives. Many of us know very little about our own interior motives, much less trying to judge everybody else's interior motives. So the fact that we suffer the judgment of other people, as you know, people exalt people who shouldn't be exalted, and they often deprecate people who should be exalted. They consider people to be bad who are really good and good who are really bad. And as you know, human judgment also is very fleeting. Today you're a star, everybody hangs a star on your door. Tomorrow, no one can remember who you are. No one can remember your name. You know, we were sitting in uh, the table a couple months ago, and we had one of our young seminarians with us, and he looked at us and said, who's Grace Kelly anyway? <laughs> Only the most famous marriage in the 20th century. But they don't have a clue, you know. Talking to them about Grace Kelly is like, when I was young, talking about the Civil War, it just is a whole other era to them. They have no understanding or no idea of it. So people are often mistaken and they're often forgetful. Whose estimation is the most important? It's God's estimation of us. God knows the truth of our conscience. And God will judge us. And remember, there's nothing hidden that won't eventually be revealed. So the fact that we can overlook people's bad judgment of us demonstrates the fact that we're great of soul. We do unto others as they would do, we would have them do unto us. And interestingly enough, John of the Cross applies this on what he calls the precautions. Now remember, this is also written for a religious community. He says, regard all as strangers and you will fulfill your duty toward them better than by giving them the affection you owe God doesn't mean you can't love people with human affection, but once it comes reliably to God, you have to put it in its place. He says, uh, do not love one person more than another, for you will err. The person who loves God more is the more worthy of love, and you do not know who this is. But forgetting everyone alike, as is necessary for holy recollection, you will free yourself from this error of loving one person more or less than another. Do not think about others in either good or bad. And if you do not observe this practice, you will not know how to be religious, nor will you be able to reach holy recollection or deliver yourselves from imperfection. And he applies this even further in community life by saying this, and this is very difficult, but it really demonstrates this greatness of soul. You, it is that it, you very carefully guard yourself about thinking about what happens in the community and even more about again, speaking about it or anything in the past or present concerning a particular person you are living with. Nothing about his or her character or conduct or deeds, no matter how serious any of this seems. Now remember, if scandal or offense is involved, that's not true. Do not say anything under the color of zeal or correcting a wrong, unless at the proper time to whomever by right you ought to tell it. Never be scandalized or astonished at anything you happen to see or learn of, endeavoring to preserve your soul in forgetfulness of all that. Now, again, if there's scandal involved or sin to the church or something, you really need to say something. But if it's just something where you think you observe something, it says very little understanding of the weakness of human nature for everybody to be going around looking at everybody else's faults and not at their own. In this gospel passage, Jesus says, the narrow gate we have to enter, and very few do it. Now, does he mean uh, that we, very few are given the ability to do it? No, we all are. We're all given this ability because we have grace. But the path is wide to destruction because people refuse to discipline themselves according to love by realizing how much God loves them in order to be able to return that love
to those with whom they live. And this great virtue that Teresa of Avila recommends to us demonstrates this love in a wonderful way. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity used to express this in a very highfalutin way by saying, get beyond the secondary causes. The secondary causes, scholasticism, is all the things that go on in time. Try to see the eternal underneath time. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you, because the whole law and the prophets is based on this. <laughs>